Welcome to the Supernatural Track here at Continual. Today we're talking about uh, supernatural and addiction and alcoholism and all those things that uh, all those dark ways hunters get through the night and try to outrun their past that uh, may or may not work in their favor. But before we start on that, let's let our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Lynn. Hi, I'm Dr. Lynn Zabarnas. Um, I have written a number of books on Supernatural. It's certainly been my favorite show for its entire run, and it's still my favorite show of all time. The last couple of books that I did for Supernatural have chapters by the actors of Supernatural and the fans of Supernatural talking about why the show was really special to them as well as to us. Okay, and Travis. Hi, my name is Travis Adams. I am a Marine Corps veteran and a social worker of the VA system. I specialize in working with veterans and active duty service members with PTSD. Um, and I use a lot of pop culture in my treatment and I've contributed to a number of uh, pop culture books, including two on Supernatural. Okay. By the way, I sorry, Gail, I completely, <laughs> I was trying not to cough, so I completely left out that I'm also a clinical psychologist and a professor, <laughs> so which is why I'm going to be talking about these things too, other than other you know, a writer. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's perfectly fine. And I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic and urban fantasies. Morgan, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. But all my modern worlds are one Sam and Dean could walk into and feel right at home. And I'm just a huge supernatural fan and I love looking at it from every angle. So, um, We've touched on some of these themes before, but I want to do a little deeper dive this time. We certainly know that Sam had his demon blood addiction. Dean kind of had an addiction of another sort to the mark of Cain. Uh, I guess you could argue that in some ways his connection to Amara was something of an addiction. Uh, and then everybody uses Hunter's Helper and alcohol quite liberally to uh, drown out the past and keep from having to deal with things that are too painful to deal with. So when it comes to addiction um, and its depiction in on TV, uh, what comes to your mind first with Supernatural? Lynn? So many things. There is just, there is, there is so much of Supernatural that is about addiction. And, and like you said, I mean, I think sometimes when you think of addiction, we think of substances and that was definitely there. I mean, that that shape, that was part of the trauma that shaped all of the characters, certainly Sam and Dean, certainly their father before them. So I think it's kind of the backdrop of everything that happens in the series. The way that Sam and Dean are, their personality characteristics, their traits, the way they relate to each other, all of that is really influenced by the fact that they did sort of grow up in an alcoholic household. We don't see it, but we hear about it, that, that John certainly did a lot of drinking, that you know they were at times neglected. So I, I think that shaped the background of the whole show really, and that relationship between the brothers, which we all find really fascinating and compelling, but it was shaped by that trauma and shaped by that past of addiction in their family. Okay, Travis? Yeah, I, th I think that <clears throat> for sure alcohol, um, you know, and every episode they go to the store, it's where's the pie and where's the beer, right? So uh, it's in the cooler, in the back of baby. You constantly see these things, but there are the other addictions. And I think the reason why it's so important to talk about is uh, it's normal, right? Alcohol is legal. We're allowed to use it. We're allowed to kind of numb out with it. A lot of people use it to self-medicate. Um, but yeah, I think that we get to see it with so many of these characters with various addictions, uh, cause you even see Dean, yeah, with Marky Kane, but also drinking, but also women, um, and the different things that can be used that way as well to kind of not pay attention to today. Okay. Yeah, uh, we we see all that with John and then with the behavior that the, that he modeled for the boys and that 
um, makes sense in their extreme situation. It's it's not a big stretch that they would use some of those coping mechanisms, um, even if it's unhealthy. If you think you're going to get eaten by werewolf tomorrow, maybe you're not as worried about the long term impacts of things as you would be if you expected to, you know, die of old age. Um, but I th and we certainly saw from Bobby's flashback that his father uh, had issues with uh, alcoholism and, and that led to violence. I have always wondered what happened to John's mother after Henry disappeared. Walked out one day, never came back. How did she cope? Was she functional or did she also deal with some unhealthy coping mechanisms because she's left with a young boy and no husband and no answers as to where he went or why he didn't come back. And, you know, that could certainly, if she went down, you know, spiraled down the drain out of grief and anger and betrayal, that didn't set uh, a good example for young John either. So we have, we have a lot of tantalizing clues. Um, let's start with that. There's certainly, um, there's certainly traits and have been a lot of research into the idea of adult children of alcoholics. How, how does Sam and Dean fit that, um, that paradigm? Lynn? That, uh, Dean especially fits that paradigm extremely well. Sam less so, but I think you can fit him into it. I mean, Dean. Sir, I mean, one of the one of the main things is sort of constantly seeking approval and affirmation, and having that being very self-critical and having low self-esteem. And that that really is Dean. You know, in that episode where he was on trial, we see his tremendous guilt. He just thinks he's worthless and i think it's also part of i mean he loves sam he loves his brother that's a healthy thing but <laughs> he is really sort of hyper vigilant we see it right up through the finale he's hyper vigilant about sam abandoning him so there's that that need for reassurance and affirmation are you going to stay with me are you going to leave me you know i feel like other people have leave me which comes from the emotional abandonment that happens when you have a parent who is impaired for some reason, whether it's John being addicted to alcohol or whether it's John being obsessed with finding his wife's killer. However it happened, Dean's emotional needs certainly weren't met. He also felt like he had to take care of Sam's emotional needs. So I think that uh, that's only one or two characteristics. I'll leave some for Travis, but I think those are the first two that come to my mind when I think of Dean Winchester. Okay. How about you, Travis? Yeah, I mean, there's so many that they uh, kind of go through. Um, they become approval seekers, you know, like they want to please somebody, especially Dean, you know, wanting to have the approval of his dad, where Sam just said, you know what, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, they get terrified of personal criticism. You know, it makes me think about when um, he, Dean goes to that boys camp, or no, no, uh, when they go to the, the school and you see the flashback with the, the bully episode and uh, like how Dean is acting as a, a teenager and how he hooks up with other women and then he just like, the girl specifically says, I pity you. And he's like, I am a hero you know, I don't want your pity. Um, they, they love people who need rescuing. And that's kind of consistent with those two. Um, they stand up for themselves uh, and they feel guilty at times. Uh, I've, I've kind of noticed that a little bit, not a ton, but I think some uh, when they try to justify what's going on. And then I think the, the, the main one that I kind of really see is the stuffing their feelings. They kind of bury them. And although we do get the BM moment, you know, the, the brothers on baby, <clears throat> it's really so many, and we've mentioned this before, so many of their problems could have been solved by having a 10 minute conversation. But vulnerability is scary. Uh, talking about feelings is scary. So I'll just push them down with beer and we'll just watch the stars. 
for another one it, when I was I sort of looked over the characteristics because I haven't actually looked at the list for a while I kind of know them from my clinical work but I, I had sort of forgotten that another of the characteristics on that you know list that we all know of children of alcoholics is extreme loyalty I, that's not one that I that necessarily springs to my mind right away but I was like oh that's right and again that is so Dean. It's interesting because if you ask Jensen Ackles, what are the characteristics of Dean that he likes and that he thinks are similar to his own characteristics, he'll always talk about how loyal Dean is. I think he talks about it in the chapter he did for There'll Be Peace When You Are Done. He talks about how loyal Dean is, but that extreme loyalty is a characteristic that, that's not necessarily a good one. And you see it especially in the early seasons, his unwillingness to be at all critical of his father. He is 100% loyal. He fights with Sam about it. No criticism of John is allowed. Because, you know, when, when you grow up needing to hang on to the one parent you have, you need to forgive whatever they're doing. You need to stay loyal to them. They're the parent that you have. That's all that you know. So I, I think that really characterizes Dean also. And it really doesn't change for him until loyalty to John threatens loyalty to Sam. Mm -hmm. And when John tells him, if you can't save him, you might have to kill him. That, even, even aside from John's death, that flips a switch for, for Dean. Mm -hmm. um, that's where he starts being able to say things like my dad was an obsessed bastard and, and see his father in a clearer light because he threatened Sammy. Yeah, I, I mean, you see in the first episode, he's like, hey, you take care of Sam. You know, he gives him that mission. It's the first thing you get to hear with those two. And he does it the rest of the seasons, you know, all 15 seasons. And yeah, when you challenge that belief that you've ingrained in me for so long, and you see this through the series when they do the flashback episodes, hey, you got to watch Sammy when they're in the hotel, you know, and then he goes to play pin or, you know, arcade, and then Sam gets attacked. So then there's that guilt again. So then he even wants to protect him more. Um, so yeah, I can definitely see that. Well, one of the other characteristics that shows up is an, is an addiction to excitement in children of, of alcoholic parents. Sam and Dean certainly had a natural avenue for that excitement with hunting. John certainly sought out hunting. Um, but they also had the excitement for Dean of, of, you know, a new woman in every port. That's a form of excitement. Um, taking something that was their job maybe a little farther than it needed to be taken in an obsessive way to crowd out all those other feelings. Any thoughts on that excitement piece? I think, I think it's definitely there. Yeah, you see it every time Dean is sort of dismissive of quote unquote normal life. Like he, he is, he kind of looks down on it. You see that, especially in the early seasons, like, you know, Look at these people with their lawns and their, you know, their silly lives. They don't know what's out there. It's kind of a sense of we're doing something that's more important and this is what gives meaning to my life. But some of it is also that escapism, that, that looking for excitement. Yeah, I think Dean more than Sam. I think Sam, it, it, we see in the beginning that he did do a better job of settling into quote unquote normal life when he went to school. Dean, even when he tried to settle into a quote unquote normal life with Lisa, it didn't really work for him. It didn't, it didn't really satisfy him. And he did turn to alcohol, we know, and he wasn't happy. So I, I do think that addiction to excitement, adrenaline is there. I think Sam shows it too by the end of the series. By the end of the series, they are much more similar than they were when they started out. So those, those early influences they they do show up in both of them eventually mm -hmm. yeah uh, you know you get to see a lot of chaos in uh children of alcoholics um and that kind of continues and you you see that with the boys especially kind of like what lynn just said too um just seeing how that 
adrenaline for me. Like when I talk to my veterans, when we get that adrenaline spike and you're there for weeks or months or even just a couple of days, it starts to change your baseline. And Sam and Dean never stop. You know, they may take a night off to go to a concert, but the next day they're hunting again or they're looking for it or they're driving to the next hunt. So their traumas just continue to compound and compound and compound, driving that that adrenaline piece and then it causes more chaos and it kind of runs rampant you know and then that increases uh like arguments you know and and people have a little more disconnect you also see this when they're kids because they're constantly moving there's always a chaotic environment they don't really have anything stable even when they stay with bobby it's only a short time and then bobby gets yelled at for playing catch instead of shooting um, and, and, you know, even when they're, or they're in the hotel by themselves, or, you know, when Dean goes and he starts hunting and Sam's by himself, he, he has Sully, you know, his, his imaginary friend to help him or, you know, his Xana to help him out when he needed. Yeah. And, and as far as chaos goes, the kids had, Sam and Dina's kids had no, um, no predictable schedule. Um, they didn't go to school on a regular basis. So it, there wasn't even the, you know, get up at 730 in the morning, eat breakfast, catch the bus, go to school, come home kind of regularity. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't for two weeks, six weeks here and there. Um, John said, let's leave. They were gone. Who knows when they were going to have dinner. It was going to be in a diner or a drive through. So just day to day, no regularity, no schedule, no predictability wears on a person. And that that level of, as Travis was talking about, continued chaos um, brings, brings kind of a burden of its own. What does that do to somebody? I mean, I think you almost get addicted to that unpredictability and that chaos, and it starts to feel weird when it doesn't happen. There are a number of times in the series when one of them is feeling down or you know Dean's lying on his bed in hot dog pants eating pizza and he hasn't come out of his room what does Sam do to cheer him up he brings him a hunt that he knows that Dean is going to want to do that he knows is going to pull him out of his funk that Sam knows his brother that is part of what makes Dean happy he is addicted to that rush that excitement but I think one of the things that struck me when you were talking is that it's another, I, you know, I, I love the finality, but finale, I've said that several times on these. And one of the things that I love about it is that it shows the evolution of the characters. And by the end, they really did have a lot of that regular, like that montage, that's what it's showing. Yes, they were still hunting, that was still their job but they also had kind of settled into some routine and they were enjoying the routine. Sam made the toast, Dean walked in and buttered it. Sam fed the dog, Dean snuffed the dog scraps. You know, the dog woke Dean up every morning. They actually had found the ability to not need to escape all the time. They were actually okay with their lives, which I love that hopeful message because we see Sam and Dean struggle with so many of these traits and characteristics that we're talking about. But just in that last episode, we get a glimpse of, hey, eventually they did break away from this and they did figure it out and they did feel okay about themselves and get rid of this terrible self-loathing and this terrible fear of being abandoned and need for approval. All of that got better for them, which I think is tremendously hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it also goes with like <clears throat> kind of what we were talking about earlier with Dean and his emotional like immaturity, right? Or, or unintelligence when it comes to knowing what's going on with him. He's brash. He's kind of vocal. He's a little more assertive um, or aggressive than assertive. But he, as the story goes, as a, the show builds, you see this kind of start to slowly build and he starts to understand things and then something happens and it gets destroyed. But then the muscle memory happens quicker so they can build up on it again and then something happens, it gets destroyed. And it's kind of this, this cycle, but each time they're still growing. 
it just might take a you know two steps forward, one step back at times, uh, which I think was really important. And that that comes from a lot of like children who grew up in those types of houses. Uh, they're emotionally cut off. They're distant from people. Uh, their boundaries are much more stern uh, because they don't have that sense of trust because they didn't have that growing up because of all the chaos. Well, and, and something that goes with family dysfunction is the idea of keeping secrets. We don't tell people what goes on at home. That's none of their business. Uh, the idea that outside is a threat and if they find out bad things are going to happen um and that was definitely something that john instilled very early in the kids not just you know there might be a vampire outside that motel door but that could be child protective services and they're going to take sammy uh that could be the police they're going to lock up john and that seems to go hand in hand with the the secret keeping um and, and some of that um, extreme loyalty that goes with dysfunction and addiction. Uh, we certainly see that with the boys and, and they learn a little too well to keep a lot of secrets. Um, thoughts about that? Lynn? Yeah. Oh, or Travis, go ahead. Um, no. it, yeah, um, again, that vulnerability piece, right? That, they don't really have that support, that trust in others. So they don't want to open up to each other. So if I can keep everybody to arm's length back, it allows me to, to kind of do that. And that's how trust goes too. Um, and unfortunately, most people, most people in general, um, but people that do uh, like military and first responders, their trust gets kind of skewed because it's all or nothing. I have to trust you with my life or I can't trust you at all. Um, when you're deployed into a combat zone or on a hunt like the boys. So if my trust is all or nothing, I can trust Sam, I can trust Dean to get my back. I can't even trust Kevin to fully be there all the time, right? Cause he won't answer a phone call or Garth will be doing something else or somebody will do something and they'll be let down. And it's always like Sammy and Dean against the world. And they'll take care of it. They'll carry that. And they trust each other wholeheartedly, but don't trust anybody else because of that flaw where a lot of people don't see how trust is actually like positive 100 and negative 100, where I fully trust you. I don't trust you at all. Well, I don't know you, so you're probably at a zero, right? Oh, you're another hunter? You're at a 20. Now let's see where you go. Um, because I at least know that if a, a werewolf comes in right now, if a vamp comes in right now, you probably have something on you to help kill it at least. Yeah. Well, and we certainly see Dean do that all or nothing thinking with Sam over the course of many of the first seasons. It's the, I can't trust you on a hunt. I, I don't know where your head is. I can't. And that helps to really put a lot of distance between them because Sam's Dean's in a total binary trust or not trust and it really shuts him off to realizing just how much Sam is in trouble and needs help and is hurting and Dean's hung up on I can't trust you on a hunt and there's no middle ground and it's complicated by the fact that they both keep secrets from each other all the time and they always think that they have a reason as most people do who keep secrets so there's always some Justification. I'm doing it to keep him safe, or I'm doing this it because he'll try to stop me, but I know it's the right thing to do, or whatever it is. Um, but I mean, distrust of authority is actually one of the characteristics of children who grow up in alcoholic or addictive households. So they certainly came by that naturally, and John certainly instilled it in them. And you see that throughout the series too, especially in the early seasons. You know, later they are friends with Jody and Donna, but in the early seasons, they do not trust law enforcement at all, and they do not respect law enforcement at all. It changes a little bit as they go along, at least with certain people who have proven that they can be trusted. Um, but the other thing that, that Travis was talking about, which I think is really true, is that that inability to trust anyone else but each other, again, really contributed to this 
fascinating, intense relationship that the brothers have, which is a big reason why the show lasted for 15 seasons. But it's not really a good way in reality to live your life. It's very compelling television. You know, it makes them really unique and really interesting. But you really do need other people to trust in your life if you're going to actually live in the real world. It's great for fictional media, not so great for reality. One of the other traits that shows up is an overdeveloped sense of responsibility. And we've touched on that a little bit, but you know, I think of the times when Sam says something about taking a break just, just to heal and Dean's, is, well, people are gonna die. If we're not out there every day, people are gonna die. You gonna tell them that you took a night off to go to the movies? And there's this, almost like he personally has to save the world every single day or it won't be saved. And uh, it eases up somewhat as we get further into the series. Uh, but for so much of the series, they feel like the whole world is completely on their shoulders. And this is long before they, they find out that Chuck kind of manipulated that. Any thoughts on, on how that drives a person and what that um, causes? I mean, that was specifically explicitly drilled into Dean. You are, you know, you six-year-old or whatever, eight-year-old are responsible for your little brother. You have to feed him. You have to keep him safe. You have to shoot the monster that's coming in the window. I mean, that, that sense of over-responsibility and parentification certainly happened early for him. But it's interesting because Dean bought into that explicit sense of responsibility for Sam so much that it was a real roadblock in their relationship as Sam became an independent adult who was extremely capable, but Dean was still stuck on, no, I have to be responsible for you at all times, not allowing Sam to actually grow up and be an adult. And it's one of the reasons why relationships have so many roadblocks. The other is that fear of vulnerability that Travis was talking about, but that inability to, you know, if you're a parent, to stop the intergenerational trauma going on by allowing your children, in this case, your brother, but your children to grow up and to let go of that sense of responsibility. And Dean really struggles with that. I like that the show made it explicit. That's another evolution in their relationship that Dean, little by little, he talks about it. I have to let you be an adult. I have to remember that now you are capable you are a leader, you are a capable hunter. And, and he does get there, but it's a real struggle for him because of that sense of over-responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people are, are adults of, of people uh, addictions usually go like, I need all, like if they take full responsibility or they don't want any. Um, and you kind of see Dean wanting it all, taking it all, owning it. But then when he doesn't, when there, because there are a few times towards the end when, when he just gives up, he's like, no, I, what are we going to do? It's against Chuck. It's God. We can't do anything. Um, and he's just like, I'm just going to drink a beer. And Sam's like, no, we'll figure this out like we always do. Um, so when he is kind of struggling, and that's the, the hard part for Dean, when he struggles with that sense of purpose, Sam is always there to pick him up. Um, and th that's the one great thing about the brother's relationship is that when one's slacking or one's having a difficult time in an area, the other one pulls that, that slack up for them um, and, and supports them and reminds them of, hey, why we're doing what we're doing. Because a lot of times Sam's just like, there's always going to be vamps. They're always going to keep coming. Like, we'll never stop. So why does this have to be our problem? Um, so like, again, that responsibility piece, it's huge. Mm -hmm inside those types of relationships. And then we get to see Dean as a demon finally being able to guilt-free walk away from all the responsibility. Uh, it took being a demon, but now he can say, I don't care. I don't, the world can burn. I'm going to have another drink. Um, and that sense of relief that went with it, even if it meant being a demon. And we, we glimpsed that with him in uh, the gin dream where he, can I mow your, your lawn, mom? I mean, you know, just no sense of responsibility. In real life with, with um, 
Lisa, it didn't work uh, as well because he he didn't have uh, he didn't have the extra that made it possible either the the gin poison or the the demon. But we did get a glimpse of of Dean if he could let go of some of that overwhelming responsibility without guilt. Yeah, and I, and I do think he he did he became less over responsible with time and Sam in a way, you know, I think Sam, again, very kind of black and white Sam's only method of not being over responsible and taking on the mantle of hunting, which he didn't want was to just go and say, you know, I'm, I'm gone. I'm not even calling you. I can't even have contact with you. Again, it had to be a hundred percent one way or the other. It couldn't be, well, I'm going to go to school, but I'll come hunt with you on the weekends or call me if you need me or summer vacation, I'll spend hunting with you in the Adirondacks, whatever. It wasn't like that. He had to either cut ties completely and then sort of take his sense of responsibility into something else, scoring really high on the LSATs, getting into law school, doing well at Stanford, a different kind of responsibility, but he, he, couldn't, he couldn't do it halfway. And for a long time, the brothers couldn't do anything halfway, couldn't hunt and be serious sometimes and then have some downtime, you know, every now and then dressing up and looking like you're at the Ren Fair, but not very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's um, one of the other characteristics that kind of sticks out to me is that isolation piece, right? They, they keep everybody away from them. Um, and then when they're mad at each other, they just go away from each other too. Uh, when they go off to get, like by themselves, there'll be a little montage of Sam building up his own car, getting his own his own hunting gear, and then meeting up later. Um, but the only time that you really see them is uh, small groups, very very small groups, ones and twos, typically. But especially with those two, they're constantly putting themselves in isolation. If they're a little off. Like we said earlier, Dean is going to be in this room drinking beer all day. You know, Sam is going to go on a run. He's going to just kind of vanish um, or live in a cabin and not talk to anybody and have a dog, you know, or work as a bar back and not share anything about who he is and just kind of keep his head down. So there's a lot of isolation they feel, which is kind of what they grew up in also. You know, don't you, you don't get to have friends. You don't get to tell people what we do. Uh, I mean, Sam's essay is like that my dad is a mechanic and that, or that's what he tells the teachers, like, that's what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to be a mechanic like my family. Well, and we see, you know, Sam usually doesn't have to have the overbearing sense of responsibility because that's Dean's role. But when Dean's not there, with the one exception of um, purgatory, which we all still aren't, don't want to admit really happened, and yet that's an all or nothing, you know, either I keep looking for you until I drop from exhaustion or I don't do anything. Um, but we certainly see after Sam learns from that mistake, um, he adopts all the hunters from the AU. And so while Dean is off being, you know, Michael, Sam becomes chief and takes a personal responsibility for all these people. And when, you know, the links he goes to to get Dean back from being a demon and to to uh, heal the mark of Cain and to get Dean back from Michael. Sam is perfectly capable of being just as dysfunctional as Dean. He just doesn't need, usually need to do it because that's Dean's job. I mean, I think it's interesting too. You can also see Sam's evolution in that. Like if you think of what happened to Sam uh, in mystery spot when he lost Dean the, the first time or when he lost Dean to hell, those early times when he lost Dean, he almost became like an automaton. Like he, he was completely isolated. He was just sticking up his own arms, eating because he had to eat like a machine, you know, not, not connecting with anyone, just completely dysfunctional. Over time, he doesn't become any less determined to find Dean, except for the Amelia time, which I will always believe he had a mental breakdown and that's what was happening. But anyway, I other than that, imagined. other than that, um, he's just as driven, but 
he doesn't cut himself off. Like he does, he enlists the hunters. He talks to other people. He shares how he's feeling a little bit with Jody and with Donna. Like he has a, even Rowena, he has like a support system more around him. So I think we, I, I think we talk a lot about Dean's evolution because that was so obvious in the finale that it kind of smacks me in the face. But Sam had a similar evolution too. Yeah, I mean, you know, I hadn't thought about it before, but like the relationship that he does develop with Rowena, uh, that he's the only one that can go into her place, you know, that he's the only one that can access her things that she was kind of teaching him and training him. Um, that That is something that he does build on a ton, you know, because even when he's trying to text his mom um, and Dean's trying to text his mom, they're trying to get a hold of her and talk to her, but he wants that relationship and he sees he's never had it and he's able to develop it and be open to it with these women, uh, these strong independent women that are, you know, that were great cast members in the show. They were such a huge part of the story. Um, but yeah, that relationship that you see with Sam and Rowena is, is very unique because of the times where Sam wanted to kill her, would lie to her, would try to trick her and then use her, and then they became so close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I was thrilled that we got to see both of them uh, grow emotionally and outgrow a lot of the things. Um, I, I still love the episode where they go to the therapy session expecting to be, you know, just role playing and it turns very, very real. Winchester's in therapy. I mean, you know, this this could be a whole new show. Uh, there would be plenty to say. Broadening beyond, um, you know, alcoholism to other addictions, other other thoughts or glimmers of things that you've seen in the show. We don't really get the sense of the boys it, it, um, doing other controlled substances other than um, stealing pain pills. Uh, those kinds of things we fan fiction shows up with a lot of weed but we don't really see that I think John would have killed them um, or scoring any other kind of illegal drugs but um, what what are your thoughts you know <clears throat> I see gambling like yes the, that's how they play uh, that's how they pay for a lot of stuff when they're playing pool but there's a lot of gambling that they like to do um, uh, porn you know like Asian views, uh, busty beauties is everywhere when Dean's around and that's what they, they see and open the laptop, the magazine, whatever. That is another addiction. The women, um, especially for Dean, but you see that with Sam too, especially when he doesn't have a soul, right? Like he just doesn't care, um, which is the, the best part about Sam is when he has his soul and he's grounded. Um, so you really see a lot of the similar behaviors as Dean when he doesn't have that. Um, but yeah, I think that gambling and porn were the two other main ones that I've noticed. And using those casual relationships as another way to numb or distract. And feel good about themselves, right? Hey, this girl wants me. I have some value outside of killing all these things. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of sort of self-comfort because, you know, the motion regulation is something that they both struggle with a little bit too, you know, Dean. Dean and eating is a is a thing that is talked about throughout the entire show and sort of played for laughs, but it, food is really important to Dean. We see little glimpses of the fact that there was food insecurity in their childhood and he didn't always have enough to eat. So food has has big meaning to him. Having a piece of pie or asking for pie and having someone not bring him pie is like an emotional wound to Dean. So it's played for laughs, but it we have seen enough to know that it's not actually funny. So there's all these ways that that Sam and Dean sort of comfort themselves because there were they were left to comfort themselves a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else that strikes you? Um, on, on the topic, I, I think we've covered a lot of great stuff, but I'm sure there's probably still some more we haven't touched. Anything that uh, 
we haven't we haven't gotten to yet. Lynn, you're nodding. Yeah, there. Well, there was an as I was reading through the list again, another thing that is sort of not in the front of my mind when I think of these characteristics is is a fear of anger, because you know when you grow up, especially with someone who's using substances, that's often dis, a disinhibitor, and then there's explosive anger, which is another part of the trauma. So people who grow up in that kind of an environment and we didn't we don't again we don't see a lot of their childhood with John but he could be pretty <laughs> brutal and he could be pretty gruff and he could be pretty angry he was really driven so there probably was that and this is a subtle theme in the show but I think we do see that with Sam that he is often sort of hyper reactive to expressions of anger He'll, you'll see him flinch or kind of be hyper vigilant like when Dean gets loud and loses his temper or throws something across the room, you'll see Sam just sort of like flinch a little bit. And this is, you know, this, it's not, he's courageous. He's a brave hunter, but expressions of anger, he does react to them. And I don't even, I don't even know if it was scripted or if it's just Jared Padalecki being brilliant, but you do see that as a through line. And there's one season where they do talk a little bit about anger. Sam talks about his own anger and how uncomfortable he is with his own anger. And Dean says, oh, you just got to do what I do. You just got to swallow it, which is, so there, there is a little bit of discussion, but it's a theme that isn't explored a whole lot, but I think, I think it is there subtly. Well, Dean talks about pushing down the, the bad memories and un until they come out in alcoholism and bouts of, of violence. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one scene where Dean is remembering, I think he's remembering when Sam ran off to Flagstaff. And again, Jensen's brilliant facial expressions. He says, yeah, and then dad found out. And just the look that passes over his face says, and he took it out on my hide, even though without saying any of those words, you just know from the look on his face, and boy, you didn't want to be there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, the other thing that I think is important for us to kind of touch on that a lot of people don't maybe understand is what like been drinking and heavy drinking looks like, right? Because you see them at a barn, you might only see them have three or four drinks, right? Which isn't bad, but five drinks in a sitting is considered binge drinking, you know? And uh, other ones is four drinks a day on any given day or 14 a week for men. You know, 14 drinks, that's, a lot of people don't see this very much. Um, but to understand that's heavy alcohol use where, and for one minute, it's, it's three a day and seven a week. Um, so understanding that, and when we're talking about what alcoholism looks like or heavy drinking looks like, that's where it's at. You know, responsible drinking or drinking moderation is like two or less at a time. Yeah. And well, and drink some serious alcohol too like they're they, they, they do drink beer sometimes but we see them drink a lot of whiskey and bourbon that you know they're, they're drinking some serious alcohol and slamming them back sometimes yeah they're going through a fifth of, of whiskey very quickly and there's one episode it's one of the ones where they're checked into a hospital and they ask dean how many drinks he mm. he estimates in the last week and he said 51 <laughs> it's it's played for laughs but that, that's a lot of alcohol, yeah. yeah. Well, folks, thank you so much. We have covered a lot of territory and I think got a lot of insights into the boys. And, and I love that the writers gave us those details and were informed enough that that kind of specificity doesn't just happen by coincidence. Somebody somewhere was doing some homework. And uh, again, one of the things I love about the show is that they give us this depth to the characters and and we get to see that for the most part the writers were doing their homework and and building this out in a conscious way so thank you so much for for covering the topic and for being here uh before we go please let everybody know where they can find you travis um i'm on these panels at uh the various panels on, on comic conventions uh, and the series of books uh, by the Psych Geeks uh, with Dr. Travis Langley. Okay, Lynn. 
You can find me on all social media at Fangasm S E N. My website is fangasmthebook.com, and you can find the books written by the supernatural actors and fans at peacewhenyouaredone.com. And I'm pretty easy to find at galesymartin.com, morganbrice.com, all of my social media is a variation of that. I'm a columnist for the Winchester Family Business blog. I wrote a chapter for There'll Be Peace When You Are Done, but mostly, and I, and I run the Supernatural TFWNC group here on Facebook, but mostly you can find me here on Continual. So thank you so much for being with us, and thanks to all of you for watching and listening. There'll be more Supernatural coming up soon on Continual, so we'll see you online. <laughs>